Hello, everyone, and welcome to Safe Space, Empowering the Next Generation, a conversation with Kelly Girardi. Thank you so much for having me. It's an honor to be here. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Cassandra Robinson Stiles, and I am the Acting Chief Diversity Officer here at the Federal Aviation Administration. And today we'll be talking with Kelly Girardi about her career path, um, the importance of women in aerospace in terms of diversity and inclusivity, and of course, empowering our next generation. So I'd like to welcome our live audience here in the Casada Auditorium at headquarters, as well as our participants by YouTube on our live stream. All right, so now let me introduce to you and talk to you a little bit about our featured guest, Kelly Girardi. Kelly is a researcher and civilian astronaut who flew to space as a payload specialist on the Galactic 5 research mission, during which she operated healthcare and fluid experiments on behalf of the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences. As the first industry-sponsored researcher contracted to fly on a commercial spacecraft and the 90th woman in history to fly to space, Kelly is passionate about increasing access for the next generation and helping researchers use space as a laboratory to benefit humanity. Kelly's journey has inspired nearly 1.5 million fans across social media platforms and she is the author of the acclaimed children's picture book series, Luna Muna, which was flown to the International Space Station and read from space by Commander Peggy Whitson during the AX2 mission in 2023. In addition to her work in space, Kelly leads global mission operations for Palantir Technologies. She serves on the Defense Council for the Truman National Security Project and served on the board of directors for the Explorers Club, whose esteemed flag she carried during a crew rotation at the Mars Desert Research Station. Kelly lives in Jupiter, Florida with her husband and her daughter, Delta V. Everyone give a warm welcome to Kelly Girardi. Thank you. So just a couple of housekeeping matters before we get started for our guests here in the Casada Auditorium. If you have any questions, feel free to come up to the microphone and, and get in line and we will address those questions as they come up to us. For our live stream participants, please place your questions in the chat and we will also ensure that as many of those questions as we can reach today, we will do so. So again, welcome Kelly. Thank you for joining us today. And just to start off, please tell us a little bit about yourself and your unique path to space. How did you get to where you are today? Yeah, happily. And thank you for such a kind introduction and for everyone taking time out of your day to join us. So I'll be brief with an introduction, but I grew up in Jupiter, Florida, which is very on brand for someone with my particular passions in life. And I like to say that I had front row seats to the final frontier because my bedroom window faced the stretch of sky over Cape Canaveral, and I could truly see space shuttle launches from my bedroom. And that was something I always dreamed about being a part of one day, although I hadn't at that age figured out what a path might look like for me. When I was older, I learned about the existence of the commercial space industry. And I just remember thinking, that's the one. That is going to be what helps democratize access to space. And I set out in my career to work on every angle of that pursuit. I started my career in space policy. I worked very closely with FAA AST, the Commercial Space Transportation Office. I was working at the Commercial Space Flight Federation, the trade association a decade ago, helping to create the regulatory framework for commercial human spaceflight, balancing safety and innovation. I worked on operations. I worked on hardware. I worked at a reusable rocket company in Mojave. I worked in national security and defense. So truly trying to apply myself to every angle of that pursuit. And, uh, you know, the same way I felt called to help open up access to space for the next generation, I similarly felt called to help address some of the world's most challenging problems facing my own generation, which led me to Palantir Technologies in 2015. 
And then throughout all of that, I have kept my passion for research. So I did bioastronautics research with the International Institute for Astronautical Sciences. And what that meant was I did a lot of parabolas. So think vomit comet <laughs> and all of these zero G flights. We partnered with the Canadian National Research Council and flew on their Falcon 20s over the last decade, testing technologies during microgravity research campaigns, whether it was prototype spacesuits or fluid technologies and a specific set of payloads that we matured over that time. And the goal was always to send our researchers to space where we could benefit from longer duration exposure to microgravity. And this past year that finally happened, I was sent to space as a payload specialist on the Galactic 5 research mission. It was the honor of my lifetime. I had the opportunity to represent my research institute and to operate three different experiments in space related to healthcare and related to fluid research. And I also was able to see our planet from space, which is something that still, my flight was in November and I still have not found the words yet to describe that feeling, that cognitive dissonance of being both a part of it and slightly outside of it, not being on the same planet as my daughter briefly in that moment. It was just those were all the emotions going through my head. And this was after I secured the science. So I was very task loaded during my flight. But in that moment where I got to see our planet, it was just such a full circle moment because I had set out in my career to help blow open the door to commercial human spaceflight not even expecting that I would get to walk through it in that way, but knowing that it was eventually a when and not an if, but not just for me, for all of us. And that was the future that I was trying to help build. So it was, it's been an extremely emotional um, you know, career moment and family moment. And yeah, so I'm so grateful to be here today to talk a little bit more about any of those topics, but thank you again for having me. Absolutely, and thank you for that response. I think I just captured what you said when you said I was not on the same planet as my child. Yeah, what a modern family moment, right? You know, I think about the type of pillow talk that my daughter is six years old. Her name is Delta V, which is a very deeply nerdy reference to, um, you know, spacecraft flight dynamics. And the type of conversations we would have before bedtime that was one aspect of my space flight. I was very prepared from a safety perspective, from a science perspective, from a parenting perspective. That was new terrain for me to answer questions of my daughter about, you know, what does this mean? How is this going to work? You know, and it was it was such a special thing to navigate together. And because only 90 women have ever flown to space in history and only a handful of those women have been mothers, there are not a lot of anecdotal conversations that I was able to pull from to be like, well, how did you answer that question? <laughs> you know, but I hope to be that resource for the next generation because I expect that number to just continue to climb in the coming years, which I'm really excited to champion and celebrate. That's fantastic, Kelly. So that leads me to one of our first questions. Here at the FAA, we are big on mentor, mentee yeah. type programming. In fact, in the Office of Civil Rights, we recently launched the Elevate Mentorship Program. Now for you, I can only imagine the types of mentoring that you've had in your career, but who were your champions that encouraged you along the way and what were the most important things they impressed upon you? Yeah, no, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity to sing their praises because I think mentorship is one of the most important, important things that you can have in your career, and I aim to pay it forward. So you mentioned in that very kind intro that I served on the board of directors for the Explorers Club, but a decade before I was appointed to the board, I was volunteering coat check because I just wanted to be around extraordinary people that I was inspired by, and I was very, very good at Kocheck. I had a system for it. I took it very seriously. I did 110%. I knew that you were coming before you even came for your code. I remembered your face, your name, your code. One of the people who I met was someone named Richard Gary at DeCayo, a private astronaut who flew to the International Space Station and was the co-founder of a company called Space Adventures, which enabled that. And he and his wife, Leticia, became two of my very first mentors in the commercial space industry. Richard showed me that another path existed, something that completely reframed my mindset. You know, for me, it was like, okay, well maybe, you know, okay, all I have to do is afford it one day, easy. And like that 
didn't happen, but I found another path. And it was something about being able to adjust the limiter on my own imagination to realize there are other paths. They saw potential in me. They took me under their wing. They made bets on me. And then in return, I worked really hard to make sure those bets paid off. And they were the ones who made the first phone call to the Commercial Space Flight Federation to see if they would be open to giving me an interview. And I was on the very next train down to DC uh, from New York. And I will take one more moment to share the second mentor who was at the time the president of the Commercial Space Flight Federation, uh, NASA astronaut Michael Lopez Alegria, who also has commanded recent Axiom missions to space. I came abruptly announced to his office and he took the time to meet with me and he became the second person to make a bet on me. And I worked my tail off to try to make sure that paid off. And one of the most special things a decade later when my space flight was announced, Mike L.A. flew out and came and watched me fly to space, came and watched me get my wings and was there to celebrate me. And that was just such a special moment for me and um, something I'm so grateful for. So Mentorship is top of mind. It's something I actively practice. And one thing that I would mention to everyone else who I think, you know, endeavors to either look for mentorship or to be that mentor is when you're thinking about inspiration in your career, I think a lot of people make the mistake of only looking up for inspiration at people who are further along in their careers than you might be. You're missing out on 50% of the talent and the perspectives a 360 is really what you need for your own personal advisory board. And that's something that has really helped me. I receive mentorship from people who are just starting out their careers. And it is equally powerful and impactful to me as people who are much more um, accomplished in their careers than I am. That is an outstanding answer. All right. So let's transition to talk a little bit about STEM in the aviation field. So um, it's easy just to say join the STEM or aviation field, but it's not necessarily an easy pathway. I'm sure you could speak to that. Um, but how would you give real talk to people who want to either enter the field of STEM or aviation, but don't have mentors or positive sources of engagement? Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's a couple of different angles to that question that come to mind for me. First, it, when you're starting out your career, in my perspective, what I really took to heart was figuring out what are the variables that I can control. And one of the things that I, I knew I was never going to be necessarily the smartest person in any room walking into, you know, an aerospace career. But I also knew that I could be among the most hardworking in any room. And so before I took any new job, any new interview, even a, even a talking engagement like today, I sit and I think, how do I want to be perceived? What is the reputation that I want to have when I walk in this room? And then I write down the behaviors that it will take to make that true. And I practice them. For my first job, I wanted to be seen at, at, as credible, as someone who had meticulous attention to detail and someone who was known for follow through. Nothing was going to die on the vine on my watch. If you told me offhand about an article you read that was interesting, I was going to come back to you with a book report. And I was going to say, I also read these other pieces by so-and-so. <laughs> and I learned, you know, I, I, there's a line between annoying and, you know, engaging, but I found it eventually. But I do think the point is that there is a lot that you can control, even though there are a lot of variables you can't control. Mm -hmm. But if you control all of the ones you can, you give yourself that much more momentum to take advantage of the opportunities when they arrive. And so, so that's one thing. And then I would say, you know, I was not someone growing up who came from a family of scientists or engineers or college graduates. And so being able to create your own support system and environment, but what I did have was incredible support from my family. Just, I, I'm an only child and, you know, they told me to reach for the stars and I took it literally. <laughs> and I, you know, I'm so grateful for that, but really being able to create my own environment one thing I did when I was in college and living in New York is I approached a few different institutions, a library, a bar. I asked if they would be open to hosting a space trivia night that I could create a group around, just a social gathering, and I networked. 
Other things that I did included, you know, starting a social media platform. At this point, I'm so grateful to have such an engaged and large platform. But when I first started, that didn't exist and I had to find it. And I was able to sort of find role models and folks that I looked up to on social media, which I think is just another great avenue to find inspiration and also to find motivation sometimes. So those, those are the things that I found to be personally helpful. Perfect. Thank you. And you mentioned that you did not come from a family of scientists, engineers, pilots, or astronauts. So how does someone like yourself, who's also attracted to the mission, what advice do you have for those types of individuals seeking the career similar to yours? Yeah, I, you know, I, I talk sometimes about the importance of mindset and you know, it's a little bit of a squishy topic when we talk about all of these other very like tactical things that you can do to, you know, achieve your dreams. But I think it would be remiss not to mention it because it's something that was so important. The moment that I was able to make a bet on myself and have conviction that not that it's ever a given, it's not an ego thing. It's not like I deserve to do this or, you know, um, I'm entitled to anything. It's more like if I work hard enough, I can be just as capable as anyone else who applies themselves to this. And it's that mindset that I think can be so powerful because it allows you to dig deeper and deeper into the motivation well, into the grit, into putting the work in, even when the path is a little bit ambiguous. You know, my path was extremely winding. The other thing that I did early on was decide I wasn't going after one specific goal. I was going after impact. I was chasing impact and I was chasing outcomes and I was not chasing credit or spotlight. And I think that was something that became a differentiator too, because I continually earned access to bigger and bigger responsibility and roles and rooms, you know, and opportunities ultimately. And so that I think is something that everyone would be able to put into practice is you've got to believe in yourself before you can convince other people to believe in you. And then the other side of that is putting in the work to make those bets pay off. Okay, excellent. So there's a part two to that question. All right. What are some ways to empower and support the next generation of professionals in the industry? Yeah. You know, one of the things for my space flight that I reflected a lot on before I flew was how few women historically we've seen in these roles. Even when I myself was looking for just anecdotal sort of, you know, something to anchor my own image on. And I realized how few we've seen in these roles historically. And I made a commitment to myself that I was going to bring my full self to space. And in my case, that specifically meant not trying to you know, become a, a better version of society's picture of what an astronaut looks like, sounds like, behaves like, but rather forcing that image to expand to include me as I am. And that was something that was particularly important for me to show my six-year-old's daughter that you being yourself is just enough. And that authenticity and that visible representation was something that I have received so much feedback about from people online in my community, just how meaningful it is because how unexpected it is and how refreshing it is and how few times we've had those sorts of visible representation in roles like this. So one of the fun things, you know, that I did, I was preparing for space and I missed the Eras tour, which I, you know, was sad to miss, but I wore a wrist full of friendship bracelets in space and it wasn't a statement. It was just a natural part of my life. My girlfriends were all at Spaceport America cheering me on. And immediately when I got back, we exchanged friendship bracelets and I gave them each a space flown friendship bracelet. And this one says astronaut era. And so, you know, I, I do think there's something to being able to embrace your authenticity and to continue to spotlight those different examples of visible representation because they really do matter. Excellent point. Um, here at the FAA, we are big on diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility. And I think we can all agree that there is power in diversity, inclusivity, representation, and showing up as your authentic self. So how does representation in the aerospace industry impact individuals and society as a whole? 
Yeah. You know, and with this topic, I feel like there's so much misunderstanding around the topic, especially when it comes to diversity and inclusion. I don't think there's a single person who would advocate for lowering the bar. That's not the conversation. It's lowering the barriers. What we want is the best outcomes. When you are working on something as important as aviation safety, as important as human space flight, as important as you know, some of the incredible things that we all deal with, you, of course, are only going to accept the best outcomes. But to get to those best outcomes, you want to make sure you are including the broadest possible set of perspectives. That's just being smart and being thorough. And so I think with this conversation, for me, human spaceflight has always been limited by access, not by aptitude. And that was even true in my selection with my research institute. Any one of my colleagues, I can tell you without a doubt, would have absolutely been equally capable in space. They would have gotten you know, just as wonderful science data as I was able to do. And so I, I think for human spaceflight, it's really this moment of we are going to have the opportunity to increase access and then we're going to see a lot more of that aptitude shining. And I think that is what I always try to reorient the conversation around when it comes to diversity and inclusion. It's we're talking about lowering barriers um, to, you know, to access, not lowering the bar in any case. No one advocates for that. That's probably the best answer I've ever heard with respect to diversity, equity, inclusion, and accessibility, because there is this myth that by diversifying your workforce or any organized situation that you're lowering qualifications or lowering the bar, but you're actually just lowering the barrier. So I, I love that yeah. response. All right, so what steps can organizations take to better uh, represent diverse voices in their creative projects? Yeah, I mean, so many things. I've, I've learned through having so many incredible managers and bosses different leadership styles and really understanding your employees. And that's something that I've benefited from, from great leadership. But, you know, understanding everyone's strengths, their weaknesses, you know, their kryptonites, and more importantly, what motivates them versus what drains them. You know, you can have equally skilled employees, but for someone else sitting up here and doing a talk like this is going to ruin their day and make them completely unable to focus for the rest of the day because it's either so stressful or so draining or, you know, it's just not their thing. Whereas for me, I'm drawing energy from this opportunity. I'm feeling human connection that motivates me. It energizes me. And so I will probably go on from this talk to be, you know, even more productive throughout my day. But there are things that would make me crash that I, you know, just have an adrenaline, um, depletion that are just not the right thing for me to be aimed at. And so I think a really great manager is able to work with the people to understand what are their individual and unique strengths, weaknesses, kryptonites, all of these things to be able to help guide them and point them to the places where their skills are going to be maximally leveraged. And I think that's a really helpful way to support your workforce and something that I can tell you as an employee makes all the difference in the world. Um, you know, another big part of my identity in my life is being a parent. And I read this amazing article once that described being a working parent as the sort of Schrodinger's cat of parenthood, where you sometimes feel like you have to work as though you don't have a family and you have to parent as though you don't have a job. And I was like, mm, she gets it. And, I, you know, I, I, I just think that's another way where when you want to attract and retain the most talented workforce, you certainly don't want to accidentally lose that talent, you know, the minute that they have a child and expand their family because you've, you know, it's just a bad outcome all around. And so I think, you know, even walking in today and seeing a daycare, I was like, this is amazing, right? It's just, there's so many ways to be able to support from parental leave to, you know, affordable child care, just all of these things matter so immensely and they are the difference of retaining a workforce or not in many cases. And so that's also something that's been very helpful to me and supportive. Excellent. All right, so how can individuals navigate situations where they feel pressured to conform or hide aspects of their identity in the workplace? 
Yeah, I think it's so important to have your, you know, your group, whether it's at work or whether it's socially, you know, we are uh, creatures who connect. And that's a really important aspect of having a really good quality of life, whether that's in your personal life or whether that's in your work life where we spend so many hours and so much of our time. And so having your network of, of colleagues and friends where you can be able to go to them either for advice, either for support and where they can look out for you in moments where perhaps your voice is not being amplified, you know, in the way that it should be or making sure your name is spoken for opportunities in rooms that you're not in, in that moment. I think those are some of the ways that we can really be supportive colleagues to each other, look out for each other and make sure that, you know, everyone has an eye out for each other. I love that. And I think that kind of answers this next question. Uh, can you provide tips for creating an environment that encourages employees to be their authentic selves? Yeah, look, I mean, you know, so much of this starts in in the hiring process where you're here where wherever we are, where we've been hired, because we have an important skill. We have something to contribute to the mission. And I think keeping that in mind and, you know, that assumption of best intent in the workplace always and sort of the recognition and respect that everyone around you is here because they have something very specific to contribute to the mission, whatever that mission is. And looking to everyone around you as both resources and sources of inspiration. I always feel like I have something to learn from everyone around me. And I, I take that opportunity as often as I'm able to. So I, I would say sort of trying to remember that mindset. And for anyone who, like I did, may suffer from imposter syndrome from time to time, I think that's another really good personal pep talk to remind yourself that you're here for a reason. This is not an accident. No one is going to look over your shoulder and say, how did you get here again? <laughs> you know, you're here, you're, you're contributing and you're important. Excellent. All right, so we'll pivot a little bit and talk about um, healthy work-life balance that you mentioned a little bit earlier. So here at the FAA, we encourage our employees to strive for and ultimately achieve a healthy work-life balance. As a mom, a scientist, an astronaut, an author, a speaker, fashion designer, an influencer, You've not only shown up as your authentic self in these roles, but seem to have found the solution to the equation of integrating your work life to find a balance. So what support systems or strategies do you have in place for effectively managing personal and professional commitments without feeling overwhelmed? You know, the question that stressed me out the most when I was a child was what do you want to be when you grow up? Because it just implied that I had to choose one thing. And I, I just found it so overwhelming and stressful at a young age to think, do I really need to decide just one thing and that's going to be my life? What if I have other interests? And I was so relieved and happy as I grew up to discover that that's not the case, that you can have multitudes. And of course, that comes with a lot of, you know, organization requirements in your life to be able to follow all of your passions and to explore your full potential. And for me, you know, when I think of work-life balance, for me, a phrase that resonates a little bit more is work-life integration. And I think when you are really mission-driven, as all of us are who are in these roles and working for such critical institutions that provide such important outcomes in the world, it is probably unrealistic to expect that on any given day or any given week, the scales are going to be perfectly balanced, be, especially if you also have a family and an active social life and, you know, pets, anything. And so for me, it's more about, yeah, the individual days and weeks might not balance, but the years sure do in my life. And I also, when I, when I was pregnant with my daughter, I had to have, you know, I, I think many especially first time mothers go through a little bit of a crisis of guilt, you know, returning to the workplace, you have an infant who's so dependent on you, just kind of, even if you are incredibly mission driven, you have those moments of doubt of, am I doing the right thing? Should I, am I, you know, not present enough? Am I not present enough at work, at home? You know, you have that difficulty. 
And I decided that I needed to give myself a lot of grace. I could not be preoccupied with guilt. So I absolved myself of the guilt and that was my solution. And I really reframed it in my mind as the truth, which was that I believe that time spent away from home is time spent invested in my family's future, especially for my daughter. The outcomes that I want to contribute to in the world are towards that safer, more prosperous future uh, for her generation. And so that was a mindset that really helped me. And then, of course, there were a, a ton of tactical things along the way. We moved states to be closer to my family, to my parents, and I was able to benefit from a lot of extra help with child care just to sort of make it all work. So um, forever thankful to Grandma, who is watching live today, <laughs> and to, to pop up. But um, yeah, those are some of the things that I was able to put into place in my family. And again, it started for me with mindset and understanding that I am either going to be in or I'm out. And if I decide I'm okay, that those scales are not going to be balanced on, you know, any given day or week, as long as I can make sure that they balance over a longer horizon of time, that I was going to stop, you know, second guessing myself and feeling guilty every day about it. You know, we were going to accept that this is our new normal as a family. This is our rhythm. It's not everyone's rhythm, but it's ours and it's working for us. And, you know, sure enough, the happiest moment of my life was my daughter watching me fly to space. And she is growing up believing that's just what girls do. And not not to give like the world's longest answer to this question, but one last thing I wanted to note is my mom was also at my space flight. So we had three generations of women in my family. And I just found it so profound and meaningful to think about the fact that when she was growing up, women were not eligible to fly to space in the United States. One single generation later, she is watching her daughter fly to space. She's watching her granddaughter take it for granted. And that just gave me so much hope for the future because you see how much can change in a single generation. And so it was a very, a very special moment for me. I think that's an amazing perspective. And I'd like to add the fashion designer piece to my <laughs> resume after we talk today. We'll talk off. Yeah. OK. All right. So how can our audience members continue to follow your journey in STEM and aerospace? Yeah, I at this point have made it my goal to be pretty inescapable. <laughs> so I am all over social media. I, uh, it's just at Kelly Girardi and um my children's book series, again, is something I'm really proud about being able to take that conversation offline and onto bookshelves and in the hands of, you know, young minds and future astronauts. That was something when I was pregnant with my daughter that I felt was a gap in the marketplace just because I was looking for books for her nursery that centered young girls as the protagonist, as the future astronaut. And as she was a toddler, she was gravitating more towards books like Pinkalicious and Fancy Nancy, which are just fun, right? And, and appealing to a young girl. And I wanted to make sure that there was something out there in bookstores that made the point that space and sparkle and glitter and sisterhood and science are all very compatible themes. They're not mutually exclusive. And so Luna Muna was born with her, you know, bright, sparkly space helmet, her big dreams and her sassy personality. And I've been really grateful um, to see the support for the series. And fun fact, Luna Muna actually beat me to space. She <laughs> flew with Peggy Wix Whitson on um, AX2 months before my space flight. So I, she, she had been there, done that by the time that I was able to take the book to space, but uh, it was a big honor. Fantastic. So as we get ready to prepare for our questions from our live audience, as well as our um, audience on YouTube, can you tell us a little bit about um, your career with Palantir Technologies? Yeah, absolutely. So I lead global mission operations for Palantir. I'm very proud of the work that we do together, um, you know, creating really important outcomes in aviation safety. I, uh, You can think of the mission operations org is, you know, a very skilled logistics crew all over the world who are just incredibly operational and mission driven people. I've been there for almost nine years. And I have to say the people that you work with every day, and I'm sure this resonates for so many of you, it's everything at a certain point, right? It's the mission, of course, drew me there, continues to keep me there. 
but the people, the people are everything. I don't think I've ever met such an incredibly mission driven group of talents. They have pushed me to be the best version of myself. I've felt challenged every year of my career and pushed to be better and better just to rise to the challenge of the people around me. And I think that that's such an important environmental aspect of where you spend so much of your time. So very grateful. And they've been incredibly supportive of my space uh, journey. And so we joke sometimes that it's like the Batman to the Bruce Wayne, uh, you know, different sides of the same coin. But I, I couldn't be more grateful for such immense support from such talented people. Fantastic. So we often talk about uh, careers in aviation and using the FAA as an example, while our mission, of course, is safety related, it takes a variety of skill sets and positions and occupations to run the FAA. But in terms of your background as a payload specialist on the Galactic 5 research mission, can you explain to us what a payload specialist does? Absolutely. So the payload specialists and payloads generally refer to the scientific equipment that I was trained to operate in space. I carried three experiments and I'll just briefly share what those were. One was a biomonitoring device called the AstroSkin. It's a smart wearable sensor system that I wore underneath my flight suit. It's currently worn on the International Space Station by astronauts there. But my flight was the first time we were also able to collect data during the launch, re-entry, and landing portions of flight. And I was so excited to contribute to that because we have only had... Uh, 90 female bodies fly to space and to be able to collect that data. And before me, the majority of them were of a very homogenous medical profile. So the ability to start to expand that data collection to, you know, a civilian and someone who's just off the street fit, so to speak, is something I was really excited to contribute to. And, you know, one quick funny thing is I didn't even need to match up the data to the, you know, um, space flight data to see exactly when the rocket motor ignited, exactly when I saw Earth, I was my heart rate was, you know, here, here is the best punctuation marks you could ever look for in data. So that was exciting. I also wore a continuous glucose monitor. There's evidence that suggests that longer duration spaceflight induces insulin resistance, but we don't know how quickly that might develop. And so this was a really great opportunity to wear a CGM. It's one of the first times that a CGM has been worn in space. So that research was very meaningful to me. And also because I felt like it was, you know, something that was so motivating to so many people. I have a lot of parents who follow me online, many of whom are parents of type one diabetic children. And I don't know if you know this, but when someone um, has that diagnosis and goes to the doctor, one of the first things they say is, hey, life is gonna be just fine. The only thing you can't do is become an astronaut as though that were already so unattainable that it's not even a, a limitation and an issue. That is not gonna be true for these kids going forward. And I can't tell you the amount of messages that I received from just the visible representation of having a CGM in my arm in space. I, it, it, I almost get emotional talking about it now because I know how meaningful it is. And to be able to take that technology, prove, you know, it's flight worthiness in space and not just at a, you know, lower altitude and to be able to contribute to, you know, that opening access to space to a much more medically diverse population. And then the third experiment really briefly was a fluid dynamics experiment. It was specifically how does liquid behave in a container in microgravity, which is of importance related to safety, life support systems, as well as, you know, if you're injecting medication in space and administering it, how do you make sure that you get only liquid and not air out of a vial? So these are the things that we were looking to um, accomplish. And to your question about training, I've flown over a hundred parabolas in my research career on those parabolic flight campaigns during which we've really been able to mature and test this technology. I've gotten so comfortable with the payload. And I mention that because it was of extreme importance when I was in space, not only so that I could move in a really controlled and safe and efficient way in, in space, but because there are safety implications. This was the first time that something was ever free floated in the cabin of a spacecraft. That is a big deal on, on all of our sides, right? You know, And so that was something that you know we needed to practice to perfection. There is no leaving to chance in a volatile and dynamic environment, right? 
And the, the other reason for having so much practice over the years is that when you're doing research, you always want to be prepared to follow an unexpected result and see it through. So I had a risk checklist that, you know, told me where it, my choreography in the cabin was down to the second, right? Every second was accounted for, including Earth observation time <laughs> to look out the window. But the payload immediately, when I released it, behaved in a way I had never seen before in parabolic flight and microgravity flight, where the acceleration forces in a parabolic flight are just so much more than was in this pure microgravity environment of space. And I was immediately able to change my course of action in real time and make a decision to follow that thread to see if I could replicate that result, to make real time decisions in the field, in such an exciting field, and, and to be able to be really comfortable to kind of follow an unexpected thread. And so I would say that was the other benefit of having, you know, so much training with these individual payloads. Excellent. So we have some young ladies in our audience who are interested in careers in STEM or even STEAM. Um, given your background, do you have any advice on the types of coursework they should consider or educational programs throughout high school and college and postgraduate studies? Yeah, you know, there, there are a lot of people who would tell you that there is one path to reverse engineering a career and figuring out what are the exact steps that you have to take and sort of the milestones to get there. I am also, a I think that works. I think that is very valuable. I think it's important to know what has historically worked best for a lot of people. I'm also a big advocate of making sure that you are applying yourself towards something you're truly passionate about. And then once you have that, figuring out a way to create impact with that in your field of choice. Because when you commit to spending so many hours of your life or, you know, so much preparation on something, you want to make sure it's something you're really passionate about. And I, I love that you included STEAM in that, because I think sometimes when people think of the space industry or the aviation industry, you know, they only think of the technical side. And that's truly just not, it's, it's half right? There is this entire other side that's, whether it's communications, whether whether it's videography, whether it's legal, whether it's finance, whether it's human resources. I mean, these are all critical organizations to empowering an organization to achieve their outcomes in the world. And contributing to that is contributing to the mission. And so I, I always try to encourage the people that I work most closely with to make sure that they always have a pulse on what is your actual passion and are we still aligned? Are you still working towards your dream? If not, let's you know take a break and find a different route because you can get there and it's not just one box that you have to fit in. Excellent answer. And I think the ladies in the audience appreciate that as well. All right, um, now's the time where we can come for any questions in our live audience as well as our YouTubers, any questions out there? Okay, we have someone coming up to the microphone, two people. Hi, thanks for being here, Kelly. So you're the 90th woman to go into space. What do you think was one of the biggest challenges as a woman to get to where you are now? Yeah, you know, I, I, I do think mindset early on was a little bit of a limitation for me. My parents were nothing but supportive, which I mentioned, but I grew up having a very specific mental image in my head of what an astronaut looked like and sounded like and, you know, behaved like. And when I closed my eyes, that's what I pictured. And so I do think the kind of, it came a little later for me to have that shift in perspective to understand that 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 is not the case. It's it's truly something for everyone. And I think it's been even more powerful to have that reinforced in my own household, where if you ask my daughter to draw a picture of an astronaut, she truly is drawing a girl. It's like, it would be strange to her if daddy was flying to space. And I refuse to correct that. <laughs> um, so it's it, I do think the mindset was sort of an important thing that I didn't have full appreciation for until later, how, how powerful it is. You know, when when people ask her if she's going to fly to space one day, her answer is, of course. But but she also is going to be a lot of other things. She's going to be a mommy and a teacher and a baker. And like flying to space is kind of like the, the least exciting of those pursuits for her because it's so normalized in her mind. 
And I do think that that visible representation plays a really critical role in someone just believing from the start that they're capable of that, that it's not even a question. It sort of gives you the freedom then to explore your true passions when you feel like everything is open and available to you. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Next question. Yes, you talked a lot about mentorship and for the students watching and in the room, outside of CoCheck, <laughs> what are some recommendations uh, that you suggest that they start for mentorship? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, again, when I was early in my career, I really wanted to participate in networking because I believed it was really important, but not all of those big fancy conferences were accessible to me, especially on a student budget. But what I learned was a lot of these big conferences offer volunteer opportunities. And that is a great way to be in the room and to network and to get an insider track even to the events, to the speakers, you know, to everyone who's participating. So I did that with a number of big space conferences in particular and aviation conferences in our industry. And that was a really powerful door opener for me. It gave me a chance to kind of spend the full conference circuit interacting with the broadest possible set of speakers, volunteers, colleagues. So that was helpful. Um, you know, and uh, I think that type of not being afraid to reach out to people and to send a message, to ask for 15 minutes. And I would also encourage you on the flip side, as someone who receives a lot of those questions, to come prepared. You know, when you're asking for 15 minutes of someone's time, have an outcome that you want from that 15 minutes, something specific, because that's going to ensure that you get a tailored response and it's going to make it worth everyone's time. You know, when I have a vague question, I tend to give a vague answer, you know, because it's, it's, you know, if I'm not asked something specific about how I can help give guidance in someone's career, it's going to force me to stay at the 50,000 foot level of, you know, well, here's what I think is important. But when someone comes to me with an email and there is, um, one one young woman who has always stood out in my mind, and that's memorable. It's also, you know, you're creating reputation, but she would come to me with a very polite request for my time, specifically 20 minutes, and she sent an agenda ahead of time of the very specific topics that I was uniquely positioned to discuss. And we would, I was so impressed with her that I continue to speak to her to this day with frequency because that, it just made an impression on me and it made her stand out because she was prepared. She had outcomes. She knew that I was going to be able to help answer specific things. And that motivated me to want to help her, you know, and I was so impressed. So I think that's another, that type of preparation and the fearlessness of being able to put yourself out there. What's the worst that can happen? You got to know, I'm sorry, I don't have the bandwidth right now. That's okay. You know, then maybe the next time that they reach out, it's like, oh, right. You know, I do have a little extra time now. Let's jump on the phone for 15 minutes. And so I think that practice of putting yourself out there and then meeting that opportunity with the appropriate amount of preparation to take it full advantage of it is, is something that can be really helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. It looks like we have another question. Yes. We have a question from YouTube. Um, as we think about recruiting the next generation workforce, how can we get more women and girls involved in aerospace careers? Yeah, it's a great question. It's an important one. Look, I think there's, you know, part of its pipeline, part of its experience, right? And so there is a, you know, visible representation angle to this where it is attracting the talent into the workforce. And then there's the part about their experience once they're here and keeping them, you know, in the workforce. And we talked about some of the themes, whether it's balancing parenthood in some cases, whether it's the feeling of inclusion. And when I think of inclusion in my mind, I think of empowerment. I, I want to be in a work environment where I am trusted to own outcomes, where I am empowered to do what I do best, where I'm empowered to contribute. And those are things, of course, that are earned as well. Um, but I, I think that is one important aspect of inclusion. And so for me, when I was growing up, I I used to say, I just, I want to change the world. And I ended up gravitating towards people, leaders, and institutions who didn't roll their eyes when I said that out loud. And who, you know, I, I think that's something where people do want to you know, apply themselves to these big, important missions in the world. Having a workforce that is ready to believe and embrace and empower that is something that is just 
incredibly helpful. And then I also think this moment that we're at, there's never been a more exciting or important time to be in aviation and aerospace than this moment right now in history and every day that comes immediately after it. It's This is the moment. And I think that being able to have conversations like these, to be able to expand the conversation, to be able to merge public-private partnerships, outcomes, you know, visibility, that is something that's really helpful to just shine a light on the art of the possible, whether it's for someone's career path that they hadn't considered for themselves yet, or whether it's from a dream that is only now getting unlocked when they're realizing, hey, I could see myself doing that. I like that. That would look good on me. You know, those are the types of things that I think really light a, a spark of potential in someone. And then it's on all of the institutions that we join to make sure that the environment is great to keep that spark lit. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Any other questions from our audience today? Okay. Looks like we have another. Okay. <laughs> we have another one from social media. Um, so what are some other roles in space that aren't astronauts? If someone wants to be involved, but doesn't necessarily want to go into space. Yeah, it's a great question. Mm -hmm. uh, so many, I'll run through, you know, just a, a short list. Legal careers are probably to me, one of the most interesting um, different uh, non-technical uh, roles that you could have in the space industry right now, just helping you know, create the framework for things like informed consent for commercial human space flight. You know, it's just, it's something that as I was going through that myself as someone preparing to fly to space, I developed so much admiration and respect for the framework that had to be put in place and all of the legal knowledge and expertise that was applied to creating, you know, a safety and regulatory environment like this. Regulatory environments, politics, it's, you know, everything we do is driven by policy. That's a really important area to have bright talent entering that workforce so that you can be responsible for helping shape the policy of tomorrow for the next generation. Finance, right? We've got to get to a place in the commercial space industry where government is not the only customer. You know, if we want to expand Earth's economic sphere, we need an actual industry. We need, you know, business to business opportunities. We we need sort of um, a robust and competitive environment commercially. And so I think the the finance side, you know, being a founder, being in a financial role. Um, of course, media is something critically important than being able to explain to the public, why does it all matter? Why are we working so hard on these outcomes? What does that mean for you and me at home? And so I, I think whether that's in the form of storytelling, whether it's in public affairs and communications, whether it's in documentary filmmaking, you know, these are all really critical and important roles that um, empower and fuel the aviation and space industries. So, and again, that's just the tip of the iceberg. There are so many different careers that uh, basically any career you can imagine on earth probably has a pathway to being equally important in aviation or in space. Excellent answer. We'll probably use it when we're engaging in recruitment and outreach <laughs> efforts to young students because as I mentioned earlier, it takes a variety of positions, skill sets to make up what we do here at the FAA. Yeah. So while we have a very critical safety mission, it, it takes so many different types of skills to run the FAA. And you just echoed that in your answer. Absolutely. So thank you. All right. Any other questions? Okay. Looks like we got another. One more question. Um, what was a pivotal moment or choice in your life that got you where you are today? Yeah, gosh, there have been so many of them. Um, and so many times I think I kind of took bets on myself too, just head from my very first position deciding like, hey, I'm going to try this. I'm going to take this opportunity. They're willing to give me a shot at an interview. I'm going to take a train down to DC and you know do the best I can. And then there have been moments where you know, I was pregnant with my daughter and effectively grounded, you know, from participating in any flight campaigns and having those moments of like, gosh, am I going to be able to pursue this path that I've set out for myself or feeling like I was behind or feeling like, you know, the next steps weren't quite 
uh, you know, known to me how I was going to balance all of these things, but still taking the leap of faith that I would be able to figure it out along the way, even if I didn't see exactly how it was going to work in the moment. Um, another big pivotal moment for me was, you know, taking a leap of faith and joining Palantir. You know, that was not necessarily on the straight path to space in terms of, you know, expected career steps coming from a rocket company and moving to, you know, a software company, but I, I felt called to do so. And I've really learned to trust my intuition, knowing that I'm consistently making bets on myself and trying to apply myself to the things that I feel are going to allow me to create the most impact in my life in these short years that we are so lucky to have on this earth. I just wanted to do it all. And so I'd say all of those pivotal moments and then the most incredible moment, obviously, in my career was flying to space and having that full circle moment because I had set out in my career to help blow open the door to commercial human spaceflight. It was so much bigger than a goal of flying myself. Getting to walk through that door was powerful and humbling, but the real goal is holding it open wider for the next generation. And when I think about that, I don't think about milestones and achievements. I think about true legacy to me. That's not an individual accomplishment on this planet, you know, that those, anyone can have true, you know, um, individual accomplishments, but legacy is something so much bigger than yourself. And that's something I've always been incredibly motivated by. And it's, uh, never an individual effort or sport. It, it is a team sport. Thank you. All right. We have another question. Hi. So thank you so much for being here today. I have learned a lot, um, watching, I guess, younger come forward. But one of the things I think is critical is to share with our audience and online, when you have had setbacks yeah. or disappointments, how do you manage those? What do you do? What kinds of tips can you give that keeps you going yeah. so that you do get to the success where you are now? Thank you for the question. I agree. It's a really important one. There are a few different things that I have employed and that have helped me navigate those inevitable setbacks and challenges. One of them that I briefly touched on earlier was truly, it's the creation of a personal advisory board. And I have people in my life who I trust have my best interests in mind and who have unique perspectives, whether it's about my career or personal life. And I lean on them the way you would lean on your own board of directors as a company. I consult them. I take it to the board, <laughs> you know, whether it's a career shift, whether it's a family expansion, whether it's, you know, navigating something for the first time or for the hundredth time. If I feel like I need an extra dose of motivation or encouragement or direction or perspective, I have a group of people that I go to. And I think it's really something that all of us can create within our own lives and careers. And I found it to be incredibly helpful. And I aim, of course, to pay it back and forward um, to my friends in return. So that's one thing that's been helpful. And they have been able to help reinforce the mindset. Sometimes you just need to hear, hey, it's a bad day, not a bad life, you know, and you're gonna have a lot of those. And, and that is just a reframe that you need sometimes. And for me, there have been plenty of those moments. I do think putting myself out there on social media over the last decade has allowed me to develop a much thicker skin than I had a decade ago. I mean, I have really learned how to tune out the noise and accept only signal. And if you're not someone that I would seek advice from, I am much less likely to accept criticism from that person. And so I think kind of keeping that in mind has been something so helpful for me, especially in the train of social media, right? You are not going to be everyone's friend. There are people who on site are going to be like, I don't like her, you know, uh, for whatever reason, right? Be, you know, you take your pick, it's uh, arbitrary, but learning to be okay with that and to know that that's not a reflection on me, you know, that doesn't need to dictate my mood my day, my potential, and being able to just kind of keep forward on my path, accepting the advice and the criticism and encouragement from the people that I trust, who I know have my best interests in mind. I think that's been important boundaries for me to set as someone who shares so much of their life in, in public. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, I think that was an outstanding answer and probably an awesome way to wrap up our discussion with Kelly Girardi today. So we thank you very much 
for coming down and talking to us today, helping us uh, during this Women's History Month. Yeah. The, the honor is truly <laughs> mine. I, my closing last remark will just say like how full circle it is for me today to be sitting on this stage with you here. You know, I started my career working in partnership with the FAA on this, this entire framework of the one day of commercial human space flight. And then I got to walk through that door myself on a commercial spacecraft. And then I got to be listed on your website with human space flight as the 90th woman to fly. And then I get to come here and talk about that experience together. And it just, it all happened. And it's thanks to everyone in this workforce. And that is not something that you should spend a single day taking for granted because you did that and you are doing that for the next generation. And it, it's just, sometimes I have to sit back and think about how extraordinary that is, that what we're talking about today didn't exist a decade ago. And I think that's pretty special. It is absolutely special.